I came across his photo on Instagram and messaged him, but we actually didn't meet for about a year until um, he moved to the United States and he was studying. And then we just, we went on our first date and we met at a restaurant called Bert's. So first challenge was for him to pronounce my name. Uh, <laughs> Still which, a challenge which is still a challenge. And very quickly came the, um, <laughs> hey, um, I'm sick. But I mean, that's what you said. Pretty much. Yeah. It was May 27th, 2017. We went on our first date. And I remember I had just been told that my chronic rejection of my first double lung transplant was getting much, much worse very quickly. I was just like, you know what? I'm not gonna shy away from any of this. I'm just gonna tell him flat out everything on the first date in a matter of 30 minutes and see what he says. I feel like in my life I've always felt a little isolated because I grew up with cystic fibrosis. So that alone really made me feel very different than a lot of the people around me. A couple months after his second uh, double lung transplant, he got an um, appendicitis. So there's always something coming in the way. Um, how you deal with that is either you ignore them or um, you try to face it and say, you know what, I, I don't have any power over that. We're gonna face it together. You may be tired, I'm not, I'm new into this. If I don't get the third transplant, I'm gonna die. That's just the truth and I have to face that. But I also get to think about my legacy then and I hope that my legacy is one of perseverance when I was facing rejection the second time. Third transplants are so rare in this world that it was going to take climbing Mount Everest to get this done. And I just looked at him and I said, I'm sorry, uh, but I'm just too tired. And he said, well, I'm not, I'm not. So I'm gonna carry you. It happened that Last year, in 2020, uh, I planned to visit my family in France in, in March. Ten minutes after his flight took off from LAX, the country was shutting down. I needed somebody here that could help me, and my mom is always next in line at this point behind him. I had to explain the situation to my parents and my parents didn't know uh, what kind of relationship we, we had with Travis. So I had to open up to them and say, uh, yeah, I need to go back to Los Angeles. And I say, what do you mean you need to come back to Los Angeles? Well, I said, well, Travis has crashed, but they were like, but his mom is there. Still, you know, I have to be there, help his mom. I had to say, uh, Travis and I are in a relationship. Okay, that was a shock, and but they did not stop me, and I really, I'm really grateful for them to understand that situation. It wasn't just that you had to tell your parents we were in a relationship. It was that he had to tell his parents that the person that he is in a relationship with could die. There was a lot that had to be unpacked in a very, very short amount of time. The hardest part was to call your nurse and I said, I'm gonna call Travis's phone and I would like you to pick up and uh, put me on speaker. Uh, I know he's in a coma, but maybe he can hear me and maybe hearing my voice will uh, make a difference. And that's what she did. And during that time, I knew that I, could be the, the last thing I would have told him. Uh, I knew that after that, I would have to take my plane and, um, and not knowing for a few hours if you would have made it or not. When you're in a relationship, any kind of relationship, you go through it together. And so when the call came, which was 
only a few weeks later, um, because I was so sick, I was higher on the list. We get to the hospital and um, I hug my little brother, I hugged my mom, and then I hugged, um, I hugged you, and I could feel him pushing me to go. And I think that sometimes you need the person in your life that cares about you the most to push you in a direction that's going to help you. The only thing I kept telling myself as they put the anesthesia into my IV was, you did it. If I don't wake up, I went down fighting. We did everything we could and I won because I did everything I could to surpass my prognosis, which was five years and I'm 30. <laughs> We've had a lot of debate about this because to most people, it's like, oh no, you're leaving your 20s, like you're getting older. And to me, it's like, yes, <laughs> I did it. I hit the big 3-0. I just really enjoyed uh, sharing it with you because it gives another outlook on, on what a birthday represents and, and the chance to get older because, you know, getting older is being alive too. I cannot wait to meet your family. His mom is so wonderfully accommodating with speaking English to me uh, because I, again, am not the best at learning French. I'm trying. Um, and his dad has been really, really welcoming. And I don't feel nervous about meeting them at all because I feel like they are my family. Being around you, I think that I've learned to be more understanding and patient and maybe less judgmental uh, with people. The two things that I've learned from him is that I needed somebody in my life who was nowhere near as dramatic as me. I needed that stability, I needed that calm, I needed that logical thinking so that when I feel the world is falling apart, he's like, Travis, it's just raining. Like, you know, I, I needed that kind of person in my life. Every day, um, all day, things are going to be thrown at you, and, and, and that's fine. Um, from that, you will separate from what you can change and what you cannot change, and just act on what you can change. And don't change for other people, just change for yourself to make yourself better. I'm Clemo. And I'm Travis. And we are here to tell you that it gets better. You're yet to learn French from me. I'm trying. It's a hard language. It is hard.